Good morning, um, and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda this morning, a public briefing on staff's proposed revisions to the rules of practice for adjudicative proceedings. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some ground rules for today's meeting. My understanding is staff intends to brief us at a high level about the proposed changes. However, because the revisions are based in part on its recent experience with adjudicative proceedings, we face the possibility that questions may arise with regard to specific cases. If we have questions about specific cases, I'm going to ask that we reserve them for our private meetings with the general counsel because if we discuss them here, we run the risk of disclosing non-public privileged information. And I'm going to look to our general counsel and see if you have anything to add to that point. No, I appreciate your uh, respect for the, the issues that we have to deal with here. Thank you very much. Um, we'll start with the staff's presentation, followed by rounds of questions by the commissioners. I'll call on each commissioner in order of seniority. We'll start with five-minute rounds, but as you know, I'd like to be flexible, and we certainly can go as many rounds as needed. Today, we're going to hear from attorneys in the Office of the General Counsel, Division of Enforcement and Infor Information. Mary House, Trish Vieira, Amy Colvin. Behind them is Mary Murphy, uh, Assistant General Counsel for Compliance. Thank you for being here this morning and thank you for the presentation. You may now begin. Good morning, Acting Chairman Adler, Commissioners. Uh, as you stated, we're here this morning to brief the Commission on a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking to update the rules of practice for adjudicative proceedings. My name is Mary House. I'm actually an attorney in the Regulatory Affairs Division of the General Counsel. And here with me at the table are Amy Colvin and Patricia Vieira, who are attorneys in the I'm sorry, the Enforcement and Information Division of the Office of the General Counsel. As you are aware, we have experience with the rules of practice, serving as advisors to the Commission on several recent adjudicative proceedings. And seated just behind us are Mary Murphy, who is the Assistant General Counsel for the Division of Compliance as well as Daniel Weiss and Gregory Reyes, who are trial attorneys in the Division of Compliance. And as you are aware, they have experience using the rules of practice as they serve as complaint counsel in adjudicative proceedings. Um, they're going to be here this morning to help answer some of your questions. As you know, the Commission issued an NPR in 2016. And as I understand it, at that time, uh, the NPR was done by the compliance attorneys. I'm not sure exactly who, but at least uh, one individual who spearheaded that served as the assistant executive director in the Office of Compliance for a while and also moved to the general counsel's office and assisted with an adjudicative proceeding. So um, that NPR was informed by a hearing that had just occurred. And so complaint counsel's experience with the rules. About a year ago, we were tasked by then General Counsel, the three of us, um, to review the 20, and Patricia Hans, if you remember, she tasked us with looking at that NPR and from the decision maker side, because at that point now we've had experience, the commission has gone through an appeal of an initial decision in order and issuing a final decision in order. So from the decision maker side were there additional proposals that we had after looking at it. So we considered revisions and we looked obviously at the Administrative Procedure Act or the APA. We considered the model rules of practice that were recently put out by the Administrative Conference of the United States or ACUS. And I think they put those rules out in 2018. We looked at the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and other agencies rules to see if um, there were provisions uh, that they had that our rules didn't have, so gaps, because we did identify several gaps in our rules. So over the last year, the three of us have gone through each of the rule sections, and I want to thank Patty Hands for her support during this process, and especially getting us several interns to help us work on this project. So we had two interns, um, Amha Sertsu, who is a law student at Georgetown University, and Candace Jones, who is a law student at Howard University. And they're very bright young people who kept us on track, were very patient and diligent, and just kept us moving forward. So I want to thank them. Um, after we developed a draft for each rule section, we shared those drafts with our supervisors and with attorneys in compliance to get their thoughts. And I want to thank everybody for their uh, thorough review of our drafts. And we had 
many, many, many conversations about those drafts, um, and especially the attorneys in compliance who reviewed the sections expeditiously, thoroughly, and very thoughtfully, so we appreciate their contributions. So the draft that you've received is a consensus of the career attorneys in the Office of the General Counsel. We're not saying that this is the only way, and I'm sure. Through this experience, we've learned that every attorney comes to this with their own expertise and their own experience having used rules. So we fully expect that to continue these lively discussions as you review um, the rules. So with that, I think uh, I will turn to the slides. Several statutes administered by the commission require that a commission adjudication be determined on the record after an opportunity for an agency hearing. CPSC statutes that contain this language are listed on this slide. So typically adjudications at the commission arise under sections 15C and D of the Consumer Product Safety Act, where the staff is alleging that a consumer product contains a substantial product hazard and should be subject to a corrective action. So the rules of practice could be used for actions brought under these other statutes. But as far as I know, typically the actions being brought are under Section 15 C and D of the CPSA. Section 554 of the APA states that these provisions are required in every adjudication that must be determined on the record after opportunity for agency hearing. So the APA basically sets a procedural floor for the aspects of an agency hearing. For example, the APA mandates that a respondent be given notice of the time, place, and nature of the hearing, the legal authority and jurisdiction under which the hearing is held, and the matters of fact and law asserted. Additionally, the APA requires that an agency give interested parties the opportunity for submission and consideration of facts, arguments, offers of settlement, proposals of adjustment when time, nature, and proceeding, nature of the proceeding and the public interest permit, and to the extent the parties are unable to determine a controversy by consent, a hearing and decision on notice in accordance with sections 556 and 557 of the APA. So typically an agency's rules are going to contain provisions for all of these things. So the rules of practice have been in place for um, approximately 40 years, beginning in 1974 when the commission first proposed for use the rules on an interim basis. Then approximately three years later in 1977, the commission revised and published for use on an interim basis and for public comment. In 1980, the commission adopted the rules of practice that are now codified in part 1025 after considering public comments and having experience with using the existing interim rules. And then in 1982, the commission amended the rules to apply them to hearings required under Section 15 of the Federal Hazardous Substances Act. So on May 12, 2015, the commission directed staff to update the rules of practice with the goal of streamlining future adjudications and aligning the rules with the federal rules of civil procedure. So approximately one year later, on April 13th, 2016, the commission published the NPR in the Federal Register. And the 2016 NPR proposed moder modernizing the rules of practice to reflect changes in civil and administrative litigation since adoption of the rules in 1980. As Mary uh, gave an overview just before, the supplemental NPR retains multiple revisions that were originally proposed in the 2016 NPR. In addition, based upon uh, experience that uh, a number of attorneys in OGC have gained with using these rules in the past two um, adjudications, we have supplemented the 2016 NPR with additional proposed revisions. And the supplemental NPR responds to comments that we received on the 2016 NPR. There are a number of reasons for the proposed revision to the rules of practice. As the commission directed in 2015, we have revised them to align the rules with the federal rules of civil procedure. 
we've, mo we've modified them to increase the efficiency of and decrease the burden of preparing for and litigating adjudicative matters. We've provided clarity and reflect modern administrative law practices familiar to CPSC staff and practitioners. We've aligned um, a number of the rules to, uh, based upon rules of practice that are used by other agencies, including the Federal Trade Commission and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And as Mary has discussed, we've updated them considerably to reflect commission and staff experience with adjudicative proceedings since the 2016 NPR. There are a number of changes throughout the supplemental NPR uh, that reflect coordination with the federal rules of civil procedure. For example, with respect to discovery in 1025.31, You'll see that the rules proposed to align with the provisions in 26A that are relevant to CPSC's adjudications. We think these changes will expedite adjudicative proceedings and also reflect trial procedures that most practitioners are familiar with. Another example with respect to electronically stored information or ESI, the rules are updated to include a definition that tracks the federal rules the rules are also updated throughout to reflect the handling of ESI. The supplemental NPR also updates the rules to increase efficiency and decrease burdens. To that end, we propose changes that are more, that propose to make the rules more efficient in adjudicative matters and decrease possible impediments associated with adjudicative ma matters, for example. Both the 2016 MPR and the supplemental MPR give the presiding officer discretion to consolidate matters fully or partially on issues like discovery or pretrial procedure. Similarly, there are many changes throughout that reflect the discretion of the presiding officer to manage the case in a way that promotes efficiency and adjudicative matters and decreases the burdens on all parties like the presiding officer's discretion to manage the pace and progress of discovery. The supplemental NPR also provides clarity and reflects modern administrative practices. Another goal of the update is to modernize the rules and make the rules better reflect practices that CPSC staff and most practitioners are familiar with. For example, both the 2016 and the supplemental NPR incorporate electronic processes like use of an electronic docket, docket or filing electronically, which most everyone is familiar with, electronic service, and also provision for CPSC to maintain an electronic docket, except where the presiding officer pre prefers a different electronic docket, such as the docket for the agency the ALJ primarily hears cases for. Another big update is to reflect modern trial practices it would be a new provision for mediation. The provisions encourage the parties to mediate disputes at any stage of the proceedings as a way to promptly resolve matters. The supplemental NPR also aligns with other agencies' similar rules. A number of other changes are proposed that reflect the practices adopted by other agencies, notably the FTC, whose rules CPSCs were originally modeled after, and the CFPB because the, that agency's rules are fairly recent. Some of the changes include new definitions in the definition section to reflect roles of the various staff and others who participate in adjudicative proceedings, rebuttal provisions for official notice. We noticed that CPSC's rules allowed for an official notice but did not allow a party to object to the taking of official notice. Uh, and commissioner disqualification. Our existing rules had a procedure for presiding officer disqualification, but not for commissioner disqualification. So the supplemental NPR adopts the procedure used by the FTC. Finally, the supplemental NPR is intended to update and reflect commission and staff experience with the rules. For example, in proposed 1025.23c, which regards motions both in the 2016 NPR and the supplemental NPR, it proposes to expand the time to respond to motions from 10 to 14 days. 
Staff stated in the 2016 NPR that 10 days was insufficient time to respond to a motion, particularly when weekend days are considered in the computation of time. Staff continues to propose four additional days to respond to motions in the supplemental NPR, stating that it should provide adequate time to respond to a motion without adding unnecessary delay. Additionally, in proposed 1025.41, which is about general rules regarding hearings in both the 2016 NPR and the supplemental NPR, it proposes to limit the duration of an adjudicative hearing to no more than 210 hours, absent a showing of good cause. This time limit is based on the Commission's experience and common practice in other agencies. The 2016 NPR stated that 210 hours provides ample time to conduct most hearings, but allowed deviation for good cause shown. Another example is in 1025.47 regarding the record in an adjudicative proceeding. The supplemental NPR proposes several additions. It describes when the hearing record is closed. CPSC's existing rules of practice are silent regarding the closing of a hearing record. So staff identified a gap in our rules and we considered the FTC and the CFPB's rules to craft this proposal, which requires the presiding officer to issue an order closing the hearing record after giving the parties three business days to determine if the record is complete or needs to be supplemented or corrected. The presiding officer would have discretion to permit or order correction of the hearing record. Additionally, the supplemental rule specifies the contents of an adjudicative record. The APA generally states what the adjudicative record should contain, but our rule, existing rule doesn't have any description of the administrative record. It also doesn't require a presiding officer to certify the record to the commission or to provide an index of the hearing record. So these are issues that came up. We identified a gap and we looked to other agencies as to how they handle those issues and proposed uh, new provisions in the rule to accommodate, accommodate those issues. This concludes our high-level briefing. I did want to remind the Commission that this is a proposed rule, so we're putting it out for notice and comment. I think there are plenty of issues in there for everybody. Um, lots of continuing discussion, I'm sure, but um, staff's goal you know, our rules are almost 40 years old, so we'd like to move forward in some way. Um, and so we've put some, a proposal out for you guys to chew on, and we welcome your consideration and your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, and thank you for the uh, many months of hard work that you put into it. I can see that there's an enormous amount of effort that went into it. Um, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I would appreciate it if you would share with us a red line version of the changes. I lived through the changes in 2016, and as I was going through it, there were times when I couldn't remember whether this was something that was in the original rules or something that was changed. So uh, I'm asked that we be given a copy of the red line version. Can I clarify a red line of the supplemental to the existing? Of the supplemental to uh, the existing and also of the supplemental to the 2016 NPR because I liked a lot of the provisions in the 2016 NPR, some of which are no longer there. So I'd like to know uh, with respect to that what was changed. And in particular, some of those I'd like to know why. So I guess my question, and I should know the answer to this, are the comments that were filed in response to the NPR easily available to us to examine? We can certainly provide those. They should be I would on regulations.gov, but that. we can provide the comments as well. And they are summarized in the rules. Actually, I'd like to read the raw comments, if I might. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, let me preface this question with, a, with an observation, and I'm somebody who lived through the changes in the rules from the original one in 1974 through the 1980 and through the uh, 2016 proposal. Um, and I just want to reiterate something that at least concerns me. We're not like a lot of other agencies. We're like some, but we're not like a lot of other agencies because our main duty is to protect people's lives and limbs from dangerous products. If we're going to do that, we need to act as quickly as possible, consistent with due process. I think that's particularly critical when it comes to adjudicating cases where consumers are at risk, and they're at risk during months of litigation. And that's something that is always 
uh, uppermost in my mind. Uh, and as I say, I can remember going back to 1980, if you read some of the language in the Federal Register notice, the big mover was cases aren't expeditiously handled. We've got to come up with rules that promote expeditiousness in the process. I don't think we've seen much progress. If anything, to my mind, we've seen some regression. I'm sure there are a lot of factors that contribute to delays, but I wanted to mention two that particularly trouble me. First, I see unnecessary and unreasonable discovery delays that ALJs simply will not police. And second, aside from the discovery abuses, I see ALJs who simply will not move cases quickly, in part from my perspective because they don't seem very knowledgeable about our law and they seem to want to relitigate settled case law. And that's just a general observation, but here's my question and concern. So the stated goal of aligning our rules of practice with the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, and I heard you say this a couple times, was to align them to rules that practitioners and CPSC staff are comfortable with. I think that's an important consideration, but for me that shouldn't be dispositive. I think the controlling criterion always has to be, can we move cases efficiently and swiftly, even if it means that we depart from the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. So let me just mention a couple of things that cause me concern, uh, and that has to do with the length of proceedings. First of all, we've removed from the 2016 NPR a proposed 150-day time limit for completing discovery, and the reason was commentators, commenters thought that wasn't enough, but that's a five-month extension. We extended the time for an initial decision to become final from 40 to 50 days. We added 30 days to the time for the presiding officer to file an initial decision. That's from 60 days to 90 days. We added time for filing initial disclosure to 14 days instead of five. And we, the filing of pretrial briefs, now it's a 30-day and not a 10-day period before the hearing. Um, and so I guess my question, I think your, your observation was we did this because uh, We've tried to put ourselves in the shoes of the decision maker, but I'm also a decision maker, and I'm not sure I like that. So can you uh, explain sort of in general summary fashion why we did so much that ended up adding time limits as, instead of shortening them? take a stab at at least okay. one of those. It's um, okay. It's a, it's a broad <laughs> question. Uh, on the 30 days, for example, on the... Um, final pre-hearing brief, the, ex the change from 10 to 30 days. I think that the reason for that tracks very closely the concepts that underlie the mediation section. More specifically, if final pre-hearing briefs are due 30 days before the hearing, it still gives parties a chance to get to the table, to get to yes. If they're only due 10 days before, we're running out of time, at that point, Exhibits are being printed, prepared, shipped. Parties may be less likely to come to the table. So I can at least tell you with respect to that provision, that was to complement mediation and try to encourage that process to go forward as much as possible up until the hearing. I appreciate it, and, that, and that's why I would like to read some of the comments uh, to the NPR to get a better sense of what was going on. I've used up my time. Uh, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the team and all the rest of the staff that really did an excellent job. It's obviously been a, a number of years the Commission has been looking at this, and this is a very productive step forward. And so we deeply appreciate the work, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Uh, I just wanted to, I guess, give you a chance to continue answering Chairman Adler's question, if there's more that you wanted to address on the time factor. I have a similar question, but if you had not completed your answer, I wanted to give you a chance to finish. I think on each of these issues, there's going to be a different kind of thing that we were looking at. It's not an overall kind of answer, right? You're gonna to have to look specifically at each one. I think one of them he mentioned was when, a, when an initial decision becomes a final decision. Um, and that's because I think the supplemental NPR explains, and people may remember, three things are due on the same day. So, at 5 p.m. on the 40th day, the appeal has to be perfected. 
if an appeal isn't perfected, the commission has to decide whether it wants to review the initial decision on its own accord at the same time. And also the secretariat is supposed to um, enter an order making the initial decision the final decision if there's no appeal and no commission review unless otherwise directed by the commission. And they all have to happen at the same time. So it's just impractical. You don't know what's happening at that point. So we spaced it out. If you don't like five days, a day. But if everything is due at 5 o'clock on the same day, it's kind of chaos. We need to space it out a little bit so the secretariat, so the commission knows, was the appeal perfected? Okay, maybe we got to think, do we want to review this or not? Um, and then if neither of those things happen, the secretariat then has time to say, okay, neither of those things happen. Now I'm supposed to do this other thing, which is create this order, making the initial decision the final order. So it's not to add delay, it's just practical. And if five days is too much, it's, you know, another, another amount of time would be sufficient, but it's just solving a practical issue. And one day or even a few hours would help so that all of these things aren't due at the same time on the same day. Thank you. That's very helpful. And obviously, the, some of the experience that has been gained over the past few years is certainly some of the best uh, and most useful evidence the practical experience that the teams have had to try to enhance the rules consistent with the goals. Does the general counsel's office have a sense as to how long cases should take now that there's been a time limit, as Chairman Adler mentioned, removed like a hard cap? Do we have a sense in terms of, of days of what the expectation is based on the if we moved into this model of how long a case would take? I think um, the compliance attorneys have mapped out the time in cases, and maybe they would be able to provide a better answer. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I think that there is an expectation that there would be a 300-day um, time from the beginning of the complaint until the, uh, the hearing. Um, because we have imposed some of the federal rules of civil procedure for discovery, we're hoping that we have a more condensed, efficient discovery process. We now limit the number of interrogatories consistent with the federal rule, uh, the number of depositions, no, none of which was in our original um, rules. So we really are trying to be more efficient that way. Um, I would be hopeful that we could do it within 30 days, within 300 days. Um, I think sometimes if there are you know, very significant um, discovery matters, that might take longer. But we certainly move to because we very much share Commissioner Adler's statement about the importance of uh, obtaining a voluntary recall for a matter which involves a defective product that can harm consumers. And presumably you obviously would not have proposed something or uh, proposed that the commission proposed something if you didn't think that it was going to help with those goals of being efficient uh, and also fair at the same time. I think that's the case, yes. And uh, Chairman Adler actually raised a really interesting point about the uh, administrative law judges. And from your experience, Ms. Murphy, in particular, having sat in the rooms, and obviously please don't talk about any specific ALJs, but just as a general matter, do you find that the ALJs have a lack of understanding of our specific laws? And if so, how much does that impact uh, the adjudication itself? I think it's variable. Okay, so nothing that should be addressed through the rules, for instance, in terms of how we would try to find an ALJ or the expectations of ALJs. I can't imagine how you would build something into the rules that would um, account for that. Okay, great. My time has expired. Thank you so much. Thank you. We turn to now our resident litigation expert, Commissioner Biacco. Thank you. Um, thank you all for this. This is a huge project. I, I've sat on a federal rules um, a committee before um, for a short period of time, and I, I appreciate what you, you went through to try to put this together. And um, let me say a couple things. Um, I am a supporter of the um, uh, mediation concept, so I'm glad to see that's in here. Um, I think that's helpful. Um, I am. I, I, I appreciate the time issues. And so, um, Chairman Adler, I was 13 when the original um, rules came into place, so I can't really speak to those. But the last 20 years, I acted and acted under and lived through the application of the federal rules. So I, I think um, I understand them, and I will try to help in any way I can on that point. To, uh, to address um, uh, something that... Uh, Commissioner Kay raised on the um, on the uh, 
administrative law judges? Do they uh, do they understand our laws? And 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 Ms. Murphy indicated that it's variable. I don't think that's any different than being in a, a state or federal court. I mean, sometimes you get a judge who's familiar with your issue, and sometimes you don't. And I, I I'm sure that. Judges um, spend uh, as much time as possible getting to know the issue and bringing themselves up to speed, but I, I agree that it, it just depends um, on, on who you get and who you draw and what the issues are. Um, I, I, I know you spent a lot of time on this. The one overarching thing that does trouble me, however, is the discretion we've given the presiding officer. And the reason that troubles me is because well, I'm hearing discussions on, you know, we want to make this efficient and we want to make this, uh, you know, no delays and try to try to move things along. So you've done all this work and then basically you've given a presiding officer, who's variable, the opportunity to throw it all out the window. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I think that that needs to be tightened up. And, I, and you know, we can talk about this in the weeds uh, later on, but, you know, I think there should be a baseline that the presiding officer has to follow so we can keep the matters moving on. Um, but to give such broad discretion for, he, uh, for him or her to throw everything out the window, I, I just think cuts against us. On the timing issue, so I'm looking at the slide um, number 13. So uh, we're, we're changing the time to respond to motions from 10 days to 14 days. I'm okay with that, not a big fan, and I'll tell you why in a second. The duration of the adjudicative hearing to no more than 210 hours absent a showing of good cause. Again, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a choice we can make, and I'm not a big fan of this, um, of shortening the time, only because, um, I, sometimes I think it's to put a, a case, depending upon the issue, um, con conceptually, it's fine. But to put a case in a number of hours sometimes ties the hands of either side, including our side. So um, I, I just caution you on that. Um, but I can live with that. That's the next one I can't live with. Anybody who's ever tried to put a hearing, a, a, an appeal record together, it, three days is just... Um, and, and again, I want to stay away from the weeds, but I think we ought to look at some of this stuff um, uh, a little bit more, close, more closely. Ms. House, I, you, you raised a very good point that when some of this stuff is due on the same day, it's just a lot. So there are areas that I, I agree with you, we might need to just make some tweaks and adjustments as far as time. Um, I, I have a, 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 a general question I wanted to ask. So I. I've heard, um, you know, and I've seen in, in your presentation, um, we've tried to align these rules with the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. I think Ms. Vieira said we coordinated with the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and we looked to other agencies. What process did you use to decide when you, well, first of all, let me ask, what does align mean? What, what does that mean? Well, typically in the discovery area, we adopted, you know, interrogatories you know, the broad discovery sections, we just adopted it. And 1025.31, um, the compliance attorneys actually went through Federal Rule 26. Some of it applies in our cases, some of it doesn't. And um, we decided to do something more affirmative and list all of the sections we were actually adopting. So did that's you, the way. Did you adopt them wholesale? When you adopted the Federal Rules, did you adopt them wholesale? Because let, let me ask a finer question, uh, just to close this loop. There were instances where definitions were provided for in the federal rules, but we chose instead to go with the FTC rule. How was that decision made? When did, how did we decide when to adopt the language in the federal rules as opposed to, let's go with the FTC rule here? If you look at aligning with the federal rules, typically that's going to be in the discovery section. When it's all of these other agency-specific kinds of practices, then we would be looking at typically the other agencies and what they've done. And as we said, our rules were originally modeled after the FTC. So we actually went through all of, you know, we might have looked at two or three different agencies, the model rules, and, you know, for a year went methodically through this and tried to decide what makes sense for our agency based on our experience. Thank you. My time is up. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, and thank you all for being here and for the clear uh, hard work that went into drafting uh, a, a fairly sizable effort at uh, re revamping the, 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 the rules of procedure. 
Um, moving forward, I, I think we all share the goal that the adjudicative rules that we apply be fair and transparent and provide for an expeditious process on our end um, so that we're able to accomplish our mission um, and so that we're able to uh, get it the right outcome as quick as possible. Um, building on some of Commissioner Biaco's questioning, it, it seems that, that, and I'm still working through this, so bear with me, but there are uh, provisions that are sort of lifted wholesale from the federal rules. There are pr provisions in here that are borrowed from sister agencies. And then the third category would be sort of updates that are designed to reflect the commission and staff experiences in recent adjudications. And recognizing the restrictions on the, the public questioning here and not being able to get into specific cases, um, the concern that I have and, and reading through this with a, a, a closer eye will be to make sure that these updates aren't sort of modeled after scenarios where uh, the commission has been bound by the existing rules and unable to get at a certain outcome that it wanted to get at and therefore sort of ad hoc adopting new rules that are designed to get at a particular outcome at the expense of due process or procedural fairness to the respondents. Um, the one question that I, I, I do have, actually I have a couple, um, are any of the updates here designed with, the, with, with an eye towards expediency to make it easier for respondents to get into district court quicker where the federal rules fully apply? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and under the current administrative procedures, um, do you have statistics about the success rate of respondents in agency administrative procedures? I don't have that information. Okay, could you get that? Thank you. And um, likewise, my next question is, if, if, if you were able to talk a little bit about what the commission's appellate success rate is with decisions coming out of our process. I don't think we're prepared to speak on that, but that's something else that we can get for you. I'd appreciate that. I've got more questions, but uh, I'll, I'll save them for a later date. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Um, resuming a uh, question I have, and uh, again, going to a, a more ge general approach to this. Really, when I remember when I was in law school taking an administrative law course, one of the hallmarks of administrative law uh, approaches, especially adjudication, was that they're supposed to be more informal and speedier than cases in the courts. And so picking up on a point that Commissioner Biaco was making about what do you mean by alignment, it sounds to me like uh, in many places we just made them the same as the federal rules because everybody knows what they are and they're comfortable with them. And I certainly think that's an important consideration, but as I said, I'm not sure that's the most important consideration. So. Uh, did we try to look at this from a very fresh perspective and say the federal rules provide a good framework if you're in federal district court, but these are administrative cases and they're supposed to be more informal and uh, more speedy. Did, did, did that control your thinking as you were assessing the rules? I did want to point out that the federal rules of civil procedure were updated substantially in 2015 to make them more efficient, to make them more speedy. So it's not like um, we weren't aware of that issue. Part of the reason why we adopted it is because they have changed and they're supposed to be more efficient and move cases along to enable, you know, to manage discovery, to make it more limited in certain cases, to provide for initial mandatory disclosures early in the case, which should help to move things along. So it's not that we adopted the federal rules just because everybody knows them. That's certainly an advantage. And when we have ALJs who have no experience at our agency, it certainly helps, right, because they understand these rules. So that should make it more efficient. They should be able to apply this law more quickly because they're going to have experience with it. Um, and if I've left anything out, Mary, I mean, that it wasn't just because that was an easy thing to do. It actually is more efficient than what we've got. Yeah, and you make a good point. The federal rules now have been in effect, you said, since 2015. Have there been studies about whether that's actually promoted greater efficiency and speed within the uh, federal courts? 
I don't know, but we can find out. I'd be very curious because uh, we, we're probably now at a point where there should be some returns that would tell us whether they're actually doing what they were supposed to do, and I certainly appreciate that answer. Um, let me ask about the federal rules of evidence. When I looked at page 125, it says, the federal rules of evidence shall apply to all adjudicative proceedings held pursuant to this part. And uh, again, I go back to my point. Uh, why do we uh, stick so closely to the federal rules of evidence? And uh, I'll just pick one specific example that concerns me, and that is with respect to hearsay. Um, when I recall the 2016 uh, NPR, uh, we had a, a broader uh, section addressing uh, hearsay in which we said that uh, hearsay would be admitted if it's relevant material and bears satisfactory addition or reliability so that its use is fair. Um, and we got a comment that I think from the ABA saying, well, that's self-contradictory, and I can't figure out why it's self-contradictory, but it looks like we're going to be locked more closely to uh, the federal rules of evidence when it comes to hearsay, and it seems to me that ought to be one of the big areas where we depart from the federal rules of evidence. Do you have a comment or response to that? Um, I, I think that um, part of the basis for applying the federal rules of evidence, again, was to kind of lay a groundwork for everyone's understanding. The presiding officer always has the discretion um, to uh, allow evidence in. I mean, I think the beginning of the evidence section is that evidence that would be inadmissible uh, is not just inadmissible because it would be inadmissible under that. And it's, there is still some, some significant leeway for the presiding officer to move things through. Yeah, and I want to go back to a point that Commissioner Biacco made. My problem is that when we give presiding officers this much discretion, uh, the result, at least from my perspective, hasn't been that good. And the language you just cited was language that we had in the 2016 NPR, but it also gave this additional explanation about when we would permit hearsay, and that additional language was removed. And I. I must admit I'm baffled when I look at the ABA comment that it's self-contradictory. It didn't seem self-contradictory at all to me. What we did is we looked at other agencies and how they dealt with this issue. There's no doubt that the, the rules of evidence are relaxed at an agency proceeding. Mm -hmm. And if you look at 1025.43a, we adopted some language from other agencies that basically makes this clear. So this provision now, since we do have loaned ALJs, has precedent in other agencies and how it's been interpreted. So we'll be able to use that to move things along. It's not just going to be us as a one-off with a comment about hearsay. We're going to apply law that's been used at other agencies to relax the federal rules of evidence. Yeah, that's I wish us <laughs> I wish us good luck. And again, back to uh, Commissioner Biacco's point. Uh, I don't like the idea that we're giving so much discretion to the presiding officer. I look at page 84 and it says, our rules vest broad discretion in the presiding officer to allow him or her to alter time limitations and other procedural aspects of, the, of a case as required by the complexity of the particular matter involved. And in the abstract, you can't really dispute that. Uh, but this is what our current rules do, uh, which means that uh, we have not been able to control what ALJs do. So I guess I do have a question. Is there no way to put in some limits and some deadlines on what ALJs do? And just to think out loud for one example, uh, if an ALJ wants to extend anything during a proceeding for good cause, uh, and if it's a long extension, shouldn't we require the ALJ to put that right in writing and uh, at a certain point come to the commission and say, should this be extended for good cause? I realize it's very difficult to police ALJs and we want to give them discretion but it feels to me like we're giving them more discretion to extend than discretion to narrow. So if you have a response, I'd be, well, I'd Definitely appreciate the it. rules talk about um, the ALJ has the ability to shorten time limits, but you're right, typically they're lengthening time limits and that language is currently here. So certainly there are ways that you could try to encourage or rein in too much discretion. But I think one of your comments was about giving the presiding officer addi additional time to for example, draft the initial decision in order. And, you know, I think about our loaned ALJs, for example, and Randy Butterini used and to all say, of them are loaned, who's off in yeah. retirement land, you can have it done quickly or you can have it done well. 
And so we're trying to balance that. So I think in the 2016 NPR, you had a hard deadline of 60 days. The commission gives itself 90 days. And we're also asking the presiding officer now to give us, um, to certify the record, right? And to give us an index, so we're adding things. So in every case is gonna be different. And the, the issues and complexities, the amount of evidence in every case is gonna be different. So we were trying to just align how much time the commission is gonna take with how much time the presiding officer gets, recognizing these new things, but also limiting it. There's only an extra 30 days. And certainly this is a proposal and you guys can consider it. But what happens, for example, if it's not done? So we're trying to create a balance and the commission may want to strike a different balance, but this is the staff's proposal for that balance. Uh, and that's an excellent point and I really appreciate that. Am I into my overtime? Uh, I, well, I apologize for that. Um, I'll pick up on the next round. Com Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have any more questions. I just wanted to thank the team again for the great work. I think the experience that you've gone through and shared with us has helped tremendously. I'm sure there'll be a lot of dialogue back and forth. And I did also want to note that this work, as you all have said, built on the 2016 effort, and that was led by our then general counsel, current executive director, Mary Boyle. And so thank you for all the work that she did to even get us to that point. That was, I know, a major lift. And we wouldn't be here talking about this if we hadn't had the work that she had done then. Thank you again. Look forward to the dialogue on this. Commissioner Biacco. Thank you. Um, Ms. Howes, I, I couldn't say it better than you did. Um, there's a difference between getting something done quickly and getting something done well. And I think all of us agree that getting it done well is important. And you also bring up a good point about if it's not done, what are we gonna do about it? I mean, it's not done. Um, and so I, I appreciate putting the framework in that, that you all did. I, I just, um, I do think that um, giving the, the, the discretion to the ALJ was an intent to either, you know, exercise good discretion in extending or, as um, I, I've experienced myself, having a judge that says, you know what, I appreciate that the federal rules give you this amount of time, but you're getting this amount of time. So there are opportunities, and I, I can, um, if, if you would like, I'd be happy to you know, tweak some of the language um, that, that I've seen uh, to, to achieve that, because I think that's ultimately what, what the goal is. Um, with regard to uh, um, Commissioner, or Chairman Adler's comment about the hearsay, that one, that one scares me a little bit, Bob. Um, I think I agree that the rules of um, evidence, federal rules of evidence, are relaxed in administrative proceeding as they should be. Um, but the federal rules of evidence are time tested. Um, you don't, may not like all the rules, uh, d depends on you know, your position, but they are time tested and they do strike a balance between you know, due process and reliability, which is, which is an important goal. Um, but I, I can't see um, throwing out hearsay or departing from that to an extent where we would promote just gossip and accusations. And I think that we have to make sure that we're not in a position where relaxing the federal rules of evidence in an administrative proceeding uh, encourages or allows an ALJ or the commission to consider you know, accusations that have no support or um, are based on you know, opinions and nothing that's uh, suited in reliability. So I think that's what the ABA meant when it was self-contradictory. Um, I, and I, I'm comfortable with that. Um, I, um, I have a lot of specific questions of you know, why you chose this as opposed to that, and I, I see some inconsistencies between you know, where we adopt the federal rules um, and to the extent we adopt them. I mean, some of the areas, I mean, we change, for example, uh, the amount of time to file an answer from 20 days to 21 days, which is directly consistent with the federal rules. But in some other areas, we look at the, we say we adopt the federal rules, but it's not completely there. And the one that jumps into my mind is the definition of a complaint. Our, defini our proposed definition of a complaint does vary s significantly um, from the federal rules, and I'm curious as to why we just didn't adopt that language wholesale and how we made a decision to adopt something different. I'm, tr I'm trying to get an understanding of the process used to, well, we'll use the federal rules here, we'll use the federal rule concept and modify it, and we'll reject the federal rules and apply FTC or SEC. D does you follow my question? Oh, that's a lot. Can you cite a section to where we define a complaint?
on the papers here. We do too. I don't. I don't see it. Um. Okay. Thank you, Dottie. On page thirteen, for example, we say. Um, no, no, no. It's not on here. It's not on 85. Okay, uh, let's look on page 87, for example. This is, um, we have here, form and content of a complaint. A complaint shall contain the following. And, and um, I, I, I just wrote in the margin, why did we not use the language in rule, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 8? Why did we select this language? Where did it come from? And, and how was that decision made? This is existing language. I don't think we changed it at all. So to okay. the extent it wasn't a problem, we haven't litigated it, it hasn't been an issue, we didn't necessarily update every single thing to match the federal rules. So this would be consistent with probably the FTC's language and our sister agencies. So we didn't change it because it hasn't been an issue. Um, the one, so I, I would I would challenge that a little bit because as we discussed, the federal rules have been updated to uh, promote efficiency and one of the things that changed in the federal rules was you know whether there was notice pleading which did not require the detail that um, factual pleading did and so I I would um, I would encourage us to look at whether or not we should adopt some of the language wholesale to keep it consistent throughout. And I, I appreciate your point of view. We didn't have an issue with it before. But if, we're, if our goal, if our ultimate goal is to align the rules and to modernize and update them, um, we should consider um, that throughout because then I'm not sure we're going to have a match. And I did see some gaps because of the way we adopted some language and then not the others. That's just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Feldman. Uh, thanks, and again, I, I wanted to reiterate my appreciation for all the work that you all have done on this. Um, a, a couple of questions, and uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, one, would it be possible to get a red line copy of the changes that are being proposed here vis-a-vis -vis the 2016 document? Yes, we can provide that. Okay. Um, and secondly, with respect to sort of the commission's role in the process uh, in terms of uh, approving complaints, um, can you talk a little bit about how these uh, uh, provisions would contemplate staff's ability to amend complaints, add counts, add parties? Right. So in the 2016 NPR, the staff sent up a version regarding amendments. And the commission changed it at the time they voted to publish the rule. Um, and it narrowed the staff's ability, I'm sorry, the presiding officer's ability to have any discretion at all with regard to amendments. I don't know if you've looked at it, but it narrowed, um, basically it said the presiding officer had none. If, if a proposed amendment would have the effect of adding or removing a party or a count, um, unduly broaden the issues in the proceeding, cause undue delay, or didn't fall within the scope of an authorized complaint. It wasn't in the purview of the presiding officer anymore. It went directly to the commission. So us looking at this language again, kind of our thought about it was it's very complicated and there are a lot of clauses. So we wanted to, and it would be unique to our agency. So we wanted to streamline that idea and also get the commission to reconsider whether it really wants to see all of those directly. Because every time something comes to the commission, it adds delay. And you're gonna reconsider the whole thing all over again. So we, we thought about it. The way it's written, it's very strict. If the name of a party changes, for example, if we sue Boxes R Us, and I'm just making this up, Boxes R Us Corporation, and it should have been Boxes R Us Inc., it has to go to the commission the way it's written. The presiding officer has no discretion to do that. Um, if, for example, all of the facts are alleged in the complaint, and the only amendment is to stick in a header with the count, but the facts don't change, is that really something the commission wants to review again? 
you obviously, it's in your prerogative. You have the authority to do this, no question. What we wanted to do was streamline it, get you to reconsider whether you really want to see all of these because it would add delay. And if you give some discretion back to the presiding officer, you need to give a criteria that that presiding officer can use that's been used elsewhere. So we got a comment from the ABA saying that it was consistent with the FTC's language, which says does not reasonably, it's reasonably within the scope of the original complaint. So we put that as the criteria. And we, it's not to achieve any particular result, but so that the presiding officer has a criteria where there'll be precedent from another agency that does a lot more of these cases and they can apply that precedent. Would that reasonably related language get to sort of the difference in making a clerical distinction between getting, you know, incorporated versus limited or, or uh, the particulars of a particular corporate mm -hmm. name correct versus, for example, adding a corporate officer in his personal capacity? That is the idea. I don't want to give any legal conclusions here because it depends on the facts in each case in the law. So I don't want to apply anything here, but that is the idea that there would be a distinction between that. Also, we changed the provision of when the commission would review. Um, so if the presiding officer grants a motion to amend, it wouldn't immediately go to the commission. The parties would litigate that issue. And the commission would review that decision at the end at the final decision in order. The thought being that the parties now have litigated the issue and the commission can review it at the end. However, if the presiding officer denies a motion to amend, this means the pres presiding officer has found that it doesn't reasonably fall within the original complaint, the scope of the original complaint, which means the parties won't be litigating it. So at that point, it's an appropriate time for the commission to step in with a policy or a legal view of this and decide, is this something we want to allow to go forward? And so that the presiding officer would have the discretion at that point to certify that to the commission at that point for a decision. Because if you wait, the, the commission can still review it at the final decision and order stage, but if you wait to the end and the parties haven't litigated it, then you might be in a situation if you thought it should have been allowed where you're going to have to remand for additional fact-taking. and You know, that would might be prejudice some of the parties, adds a lot of time. So that is the thought behind it, and it's a proposal, and I recognize that the commission might have a different view of this, but we wanted to provide something for you to consider to reconsider whether you really want that strict language that requires you to review every single thing with no, not even a recommended decision by the presiding officer. I appreciate that, and my time's over. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Feldman. Um, I did make want, want to make one quick observation, which is um, this is a very complex proposal. Uh, there are lots of details, and we could get very granular and we would go on for hours and hours and hours. I do expect that we will have further discussions. I certainly look forward to having more discussions with my colleagues, in particular with our litigation expert, Commissioner Biacco. Um, and so uh, I'm going to try to keep things on a cosmic level, except maybe one or two little uh, questions. But um, I did also want to give a variation on the Butterini rule, do it uh, quick or do it well. Uh, the old line usually was do it well, do it cheap, and do it fast, you get two. Uh, and that, that is a big trade-off. My concern is, at least for me, some of the trade-offs in terms of wanting to make things look come out well means we're really sacrificing doing things quick. And if I thought that we were um, an agency that was litigating unbelievably complex technical and engineering issues, and we do get those from time to time, I just haven't seen many of those that uh, end up in Section 15, it seems to me most of these cases are relatively simple cases that have gotten bogged down in discovery with uh, respondents saying, we want to talk to every single person who, who ever touched a piece of paper and find out what he or she was thinking as they went about compiling the case. And that's where I would love to see a presiding officer exercise his or her discretion to say, no, we're not going to permit that. And I realize you can only write the rules. You can't make the every presiding officer uh, address them in an appropriate manner. Um, 
I would also say, just a quick response, I don't disagree with almost everything you said about hearsay, Commissioner Biacco, but I will say that in addition to the years of experience in federal courts, there are also years of experience in administrative proceedings with having these more relaxed rules. And all I'm trying to say is that I, I would like to make sure that we capture the wisdom of those rules with respect to hearsay. So here are my less than cosmic questions. Uh, and uh, I noticed on page 87 that the complaint language is supposed to include a quote, a request for relief which is in the public interest. Uh, and I'm curious, is that the language that's in every uh, language of complaints? Because uh, you, could, you could get into lots of argument about whether a perfectly justifiable rule is in the public interest, which is a fairly vague thing. Why not simply say, that uh, relief sh should be pursuant to an authority contained in whatever the statute is that's applicable to the proceeding. I presume that if it's consistent with the statute, that would it, be, it would be in the public interest. I'm just worried about giving somebody cause to file objections uh, that aren't there. Just quick question. I think that's in the existing rules. We didn't change No, that. I understand that okay. I'm saying, but why, why way back in the day was it there? And you probably weren't there to realize I that. Probably, well, I, I was, was there. I was alive in 1980. And it went, I went right know. by me. But uh, w would you have any objection to be being more explicit about saying just that's consistent with the statute and the statutu statutory authority? Think as about it. it. As, yeah, we'll think about it. We don't want to provide any legal advice here, but generally speaking, things that make it more efficient or streamlined, we're, we're all about it. Uh, I also want to uh, applaud the uh, language that you put in on page 121 about subpoenas. I think if the commission denies an application for a subpoena, we ought to state the factual and legal basis for the denial, and I think that's all to the good. Um, but what I didn't see was uh, any authority for the party seeking the subpoena having seen the Commission's factual and legal grounds for denying the application for a subpoena to modify and resubmit the subpoena. Is that something that you would, uh, that you think is implicit in there or is this something that you're not permitting? I just want to add my colleagues have said that that public interest language is in the statute. That's why it's there. Um, okay. And as for regarding subpoenas, uh, the parties can resubmit subpoena requests. Okay, I didn't see that explicitly stated, so uh, I would uh, be curious. I would urge us to consider putting some explicit language to that effect. Um, I have no further questions at this time, Commissioner Kay. None, thank you, Commissioner Biacco. Okay, um, I, I'm not going to get into the weeds, but. I agree with you on the public interest. I think that could be corrected. I, I want to look at the statute and see if we can maybe blend that because that leaves a big area. But I can't agree with um, the comment that our cases are not are very simple. I think they're very complex. Um, and when there's uh, products and science involved, I, I do think we see a lot more complexity, which is why we end up in litigation to begin with. So I, I do appreciate um, there are situations where you know there's one one is more simple than the other depending upon your background. Um, so I, I I had to I just wanted to address that. I didn't want to suggest that you guys are just doing the everyday run in the mill stuff. I, I think that what we address here is is pretty technical and, and significant. Um, I, I think your question about the subpoena is a good one as well. Um, I I think that. We can. I think we do have to state um, the reasons why we've denied uh, denied it, and um, whether or not a party, one side or the other, wants to come back and reissue it based on that finding um, is, is uh, something that I think uh, the rules do not prohibit. But I, I appreciate if you wanted to outline that. Uh, outline that. But what I want to add then is, uh, I'll just ask this question, and then I, I'll stop with the weeds. Um, why we didn't adopt the rest of the federal rules with regard to experts and third party subpoena because they are different standards. And uh, the third party subpoena does jump into my mind because um, the reason for that rule and the reason for the difference in that rule is because a third party is a, they didn't ask to be in this lawsuit. Um, the uh, 
the standard for getting a subpoena with regard to a party is is certainly lower because they are in the lawsuit. But to bother a third party without stating why you can't get the evidence from the party, I think, is a significant um, difference. And I wonder why we didn't um, adopt that as well. Uh, I think our rules provide for mechanisms for obtaining like a deposition of a non-party has to be through a subpoena. Um, I don't know that we considered uh, the other federal rules, but I think that might be something that we can certainly have a discussion with. Um, okay. Based on your expertise, we're happy to look at it. Okay. Well, it's not. It's thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, but I, I, I think there are many um, things that it would help if we just had a discussion because I learned some things uh, from you know your perspective today. It's not just you know my perspective. Of course, I love my perspective, but it's uh, not the end all. So I, I appreciate that. I, I just want to say that the APA also addresses subpoenas, and I think initially, you know, in other agencies, the presiding officer has the authority to issue subpoenas. It's only under the commission's odd rule that it stays with the commission, and you're kind of dropping in in the middle of a lawsuit to decide a subpoena issue. I think originally they were supposed to be, it's just an application. It was supposed to be an easy thing to do. And if you look at our rule now, there are no really criteria. It just says stating the reasons. That's not to say that we shouldn't. It's to say there might be other law that we need to look at before moving in that direction. So, so you're right. We don't have criteria in our rules. When this had come up before the commission before, uh, my research uh, suggested that there was case, well, there was case law out there that said if it, if the federal rule in the or if the administrative rule doesn't address um, the issue, the admin the agency should look to the federal rules of civil procedure. So it does kick you back there. Um, and I think that that would be a way to just, if we're trying to streamline and fill in some gaps, that would be a, a one that we should consider. Gives the commission uh, direction. I know it's an odd rule that we have subpoena power, um, but with the standard should be the same, whether it's the commission issuing the subpoena or the ALJ, uh, that rests with the commission, but we, the standard should still be the same. Thank you, um, that's all I have. Commissioner Feldman. Thanks. Um, I, I don't have much more, but I, I, I do want to wholeheartedly agree with what Commissioner Biacco just said um, in terms of the complexity of the cases that the agency deals with. The so-called easy cases don't make it to this stage. Those are the cases in which we would expect to see uh, negotiated and voluntary uh, uh, corrective action plans already in place. Um, it's where that level of complexity is introduced that, that, that gives rise to the need to proceed in an adjudicative proceeding to begin with, um, and these cases can be complicated, uh, particularly when we're dealing with an adjudicative proceeding, proceeding that's based on uh, a violation, for example, of the Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act, which we don't have any existing case law uh, to guide us on, or to the extent that the agency's uh, playing a stronger hand with respect to um, its jurisdiction over emerging technologies where uh, a particular adjudication may well hinge on a novel interpretation of what constitutes a, a substantial product hazard. Um, so I, I think those are all important things to, to, to keep in mind here. Um, I did want to circle back uh, very briefly th to the discussion of our evidentiary standards and, um, and in particular this, this question about hearsay admissibility. Um, when you look to the uh, evidentiary rules at the Federal Trade Commission, is hearsay evidence admissible? You know, I think the way they said is it's not inadmissible, right? Just because it may be inadmissible under the federal rules. So they would apply whatever the precedent is at that. So we, we, didn't, we haven't gone back and done all that research, so I can't tell you here today what every scenario all I can say is, in general, there is relaxed hearsay, and you can admit hearsay in, a, in an agency proceeding. Okay. Is hearsay evidence admissible before the CFPB? I think all of the agencies have some variation of that idea that the rules of evidence are relaxed. So I don't want to go through every agency and tell you exactly, because I don't want to be inaccurate. Um, but we can certainly go through. But I think all of the agencies have a relaxed hearsay admissibility. I don't want to, maybe I shouldn't say that blanket, but that's the idea in an agency proceeding is that the federal rules are relaxed. Okay. And under the FRE, hearsay is just blanketly inadmissible. Right. I, I would, 
those in, are unless an exception applies. Exactly. I think those are probably more suited, like scenarios in a offline discussion. Okay. So I don't give anything inaccurate. Thank you. Uh, just one quick word of defense about technical and engineering <laughs> challenges. Uh, I think you'll find if you look at the actual amount of time expended in the administrative proceedings, there is not that much that is dedicated to the technical and the engineering. A lot more goes into who did what and who said what and, and legal issues that, uh, that, at least to me, sometimes are long settled law, but they're, they're being relitigated. But that's a factual question that we can't resolve now. Uh, I have no further questions other than to uh, make sure that uh, any of my colleagues have uh, any further questions. Commissioner Kay, Commissioner Biacco, you look like you're researching the federal rules right before us, but uh, I do really appreciate your expertise and I look forward to working with you. Commissioner Feldman, any additional questions? If not, thank you for a really superb effort and an excellent presentation. Uh, it's clear you've put in an enormous amount of work and you have all of these provisions at your fingertips. I'm truly impressed. Uh, with that, this uh, hearing is over. Thank you very much.